Good morning and welcome to Victoria Baptist Church at home. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are beginning this morning a new series, a Christmas series, looking at the words of the angels to Zechariah, Joseph, Mary and the shepherds. When the angel said, do not be afraid. And we'll be thinking about that. Emma will be leading us in our first session in this Christmas series this morning, looking at the angel Gabriel's words to Zechariah. Uh, also, she'll be leading us in communion after the sermon, so please do be prepared for that. In a moment, we'll begin our worship, but just a couple of notices for you. The first is, I know that many of you are concerned to know how things are going with Bio. He's preaching with a view at Battersea Chapel on the 20th of December. So that's just an update there for you. Please do keep Bio and the family in your prayers. There is a Bible study today at 4.30, that's Sunday, 4.30. Please do join us if you're able to. You don't have to have signed up for that. I know I do apologise. I'm trying to keep up with the Bible studies online and I'm some way behind, but I, I hope to have got another one on by the weekend. Uh, but there is a, a new Bible study here this coming Sunday. So if you'd like to join us, you're welcome to do so. Also, the Christmas services, uh, please... Just see the details of those in the new sheet. If you'd like to sign up, please sign up as soon as possible, letting the office know those services are already getting pretty full up. So if you'd like to join us, particularly for carols, and, uh, carols by candlelight, then please let us know in the office um, as soon as possible. All right, I'm going to hand over now to Simon Grimes. He's going to lead us as we sing our first song together, The Splendor of the King.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we move towards Christmas, we want to thank you again for sending your Son into the world. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing your great love for us in, in giving your Son, in delivering him over to sin for our sakes. Father God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came willingly and gave yourself for each of us. Father, we worship you this morning and ask that you enable us to see your great faithfulness, that you're a promise-keeping God, that there are no promises that you have made that are not kept or will not be kept. Father, uh, increase our faith, increase our hope, and increase our love, we pray. Father, we also pray for our nation this morning, and we pray that all the things that have been happening and are happening right now, that you would use them for good in our nation. We pray that you would use them to uh, open people's eyes to see the Lord Jesus as the answer to their deepest longings and needs. Father, we pray for our young people uh, across the nation concerned about their prospects and their future. Lord, we, I pray and we pray that they might increasingly see the Lord Jesus and find in the Lord Jesus their security, their significance and, and the purpose of their lives. And Lord, also we pray for our neighbours. We thank you for the way these last months we've got to know our neighbours better. We thank you for the acts of kindness that have been shown in communities. And we ask that you would help us to show again your great love for our neighbours uh, this Christmas. Father God, we pray your blessing upon them, your blessing upon our communities, and your blessing upon our church. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two Bible readings this morning. This is the first of them from Luke chapter 1, verse 5 to verse 25. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the, land, the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. 
And when the time came for the burning of incense, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months she remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favour and taken away my disgrace among the people. Amen. Step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you So here I am to worship here I am to bow down Here I am to say that You're my God You're altogether lovely Altogether worthy Altogether wonderful to me King of all days so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for the sake you came home. So here I am to worship, here I am. You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never
What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping when angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds scout and angels sing Haste, haste to bring him love the babe, the son of Mary So bring him incense, gold and blood Come peasant king to own him The king of kings salvation brings Let loving hearts enthrone him Raise, raise a song on high The virgin sings a lullaby Joy, joy for Christ is born The babe, the son of Mary This, this is Christ the King Whom shepherds God and angels sing Haste, haste to bring him love The babe, the son of Mary Nail spears shall pierce him through the cross he bore for me, for you. Hail, hail the Word made flesh, the babe, the son of Mary. The second part of our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1 verse 67 to 79. It's entitled Zechariah's Song, and I'm going to read it to you now. His father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his prophets long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the hand of our enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. Amen. Hi everyone, and welcome to our Christmas scene this morning. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. I wonder what you have on the top of your Christmas tree. Perhaps a star, or maybe a fairy, although I'm not quite sure what they have to do with the nativity. Or maybe an angel. I suspect that any angels that you do have on your tree present either as little girly angels with long blonde hair and big blue eyes with a halo shining, or as chubby little boy cherub angels that are very cute and cuddly. Either way, that's not really how the Bible depicts them. Perhaps you have an angel in flight blowing a trumpet or playing a harp, and angels do seem to arrive with, with noise, with light, or with a special announcement to make. And that's why we have the symbol of blowing the horn. And of course, they worship God with music. 
But what we don't pick up from our cutesy Christmas ornaments is just how awesome angels are in real life. I think angels might be a bit scary. Whenever they turn up throughout scripture, they always say, do not be afraid. And that's the theme of our talks leading up to Christmas. I don't think they'd need to say, fear not, if they were cute and cuddly. The presence of angels causes people to tremble and to bow down and to be amazed and and even fearful. Because angels have something of the presence of God around them. And whilst they worship God in the spiritual realm that we can't see, from time to time they break into our physical world where we can see and hear angels. But the better word perhaps is awesome rather than fearful. They're awesome in the true sense of the word. They're incredible beings, spiritual beings created by God to do his work and bring his messages. A particular angel, Gabriel, who lives and stands in God's presence, turns up to talk to two people in the first chapter of Luke. Firstly, to Zechariah the priest, and then to Mary, who would bear Jesus, the Son of God. But today we're going to have a look at Zechariah's encounter. We start the story with information about this lovely priestly couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth. They're good, God-fearing people who serve the Lord in Israel. And they both come from a long line of priests and the priestly tribes of Israel. It's Zechariah's turn to enter into the most holy place inside the temple to burn incense before the Lord. And the incense is symbolic of prayers and worship rising to God as the smoke would would rise up from the incense. Now there were around 20,000 priests in Israel at the time of this, this story. So it's a bit of a once in a lifetime privilege for Zechariah to be doing this job. But God obviously had it planned because he had something important to say to him through the angel Gabriel. And it's in the temple, in that holy place, that Zechariah has his encounter. Meanwhile, we're told in verse 21, the people are outside waiting for Zechariah to come out of the temple and wondering why he's in there so long. I mean, it doesn't take long to light an incense stick or to burn some some cubes of, of incense on the altar. But inside that holy place, inside the place of intimacy with God, where few were allowed to go and where it was a privilege to be, God is telling Zechariah a very important message, that his prayer has been heard and he and his wife Elizabeth will have a son. An answer to prayer was coming, a prayer that had been prayed perhaps for a long time and then given up on because it didn't seem that this could ever come to pass. We're told that Elizabeth was barren and both she and Zechariah were cracking on a bit in years past the age of giving birth. And Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12 observes that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. I wonder if you and I have ever prayed for something for quite some time and then given up hope or given up praying, knocking on the door, because it just doesn't seem possible anymore. And because of that, Zechariah says to the angel, can I have another sign? What's going to be the sign that this is really true? Although I think for me, if an angel turned up, I might be convinced enough to take his word for it, whatever the word might be. Mary certainly did when Gabriel speaks to her, but that's next week's story. So Zechariah is granted a sign, and the sign that he's given is that he is utterly and literally gobsmacked. He's not allowed to speak until the birth of his son. He's literally just clammed up into silence. He can't even tell the people what's happened to him inside the holy place. But it's an awesome and life-changing thing. You know, the people waiting for Zechariah to come out out of the temple weren't the only ones waiting for something. Before John and then Jesus were born, lots of people are experiencing, experiencing a time of waiting. Obviously, Zechariah and Elizabeth were waiting for their own son to be born and waiting for Mary's son, Jesus, to be born. 
But all of Israel was waiting for the Messiah to come, the one who could redeem Israel, the one who could bring freedom and salvation. Messiah means chosen one, and God's chosen servant had been prophesied long ago. But it had been 400 years since God had last spoken to Israel through the prophets, lastly by a prophet also named Zechariah. They'd long anticipated this deliverer, this this Messiah, but they had perhaps given up hope and turned their attention to other things because waiting is really tough. And you just need to think about how uh, exciting and strange and annoying and frustrating and lovely it can be when you're waiting for something. You just have to think about the kids waiting for Christmas or us waiting for a COVID vaccine or waiting for lockdown restrictions to be lifted so that we can play Monopoly with people from other households. Don't do it. You just need to think about waiting for the results of Strictly Come Dancing on a Sunday night to know the anticipation of what you're waiting for. And in the midst of waiting for the boys, the rest of Zechariah's story gives us some good reasons why he doesn't need to be afraid and why we don't need to be afraid. So we're going to take a look at some things that we can apply to our own lives in the story of Zechariah. So firstly, of course, Gabriel says, fear not, your prayer has been heard. We were reflecting in our our team prayer meeting the other morning about just how many prayers and answers to prayers we've had over the past 12 months. Amazing answers have come. Provision has come. Prayers for healing have been answered and many people have come through difficult times and and times of awful treatment for various illnesses. Struggles for those who are suffering isolation have been answered with a card or a a connection through Zoom or some other means. And we've had answers to prayer for comfort when things haven't gone the way we had hoped they would. And I just want to assure you and reassure you this morning that whatever you're praying, however you're praying, whether that prayer is is well articulated in your your first language, whether you pray in the spirit, whether you have no words left and you, you pray with tears and inner groaning, God always listens. God always hears. You don't need to be afraid that God is not paying attention to you and to your prayers. If you look back in the story of Daniel in the Old Testament, there's another description of an angel, the archangel Michael, who appears to Daniel, who's been praying for a month. And Michael says to him, Daniel, your your prayer was heard on the first day, but I've been delayed in coming to bring you the answer because I've been having a spiritual battle elsewhere. God always hears our prayer and we might not always get the answers that we would like which is why we pray your will be done because we need to align our thinking with what God's plans and purposes are but even when we don't get prayers answered in this life God has heard your prayer and one day we will all stand in his presence healed and whole So rest assured this morning that you don't need to be afraid that God isn't listening. He is always hearing our prayers. Secondly, we can learn not to be afraid because the boys that have been promised are coming. We're told in in Luke 1 verses 13 to 17 that, that the forerunner to the Messiah, John, who would grow up and become John the Baptist, was on his way. God had heard and was answering that prayer. And we read later on at the end of the chapter that Zechariah is able to announce it now has happened. John has been born and he's going to be the forerunner for the Messiah. Zechariah sees the fulfillment of the promises of Malachi, um, particularly uh, Malachi 3.1, where Malachi prophesied again hundreds of years before this time 
that one would come before the Messiah who would be somebody saying, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare, get ready for him. And of course, that's what John the Baptist did, preaching, get baptised for, for, and repent and be baptised for the forgiveness of your sins, to prepare people, to turn their hearts back to the Lord. With the Holy Spirit prompting him to prophesy, Zechariah brings forth scriptures he would have known very well, both as an Israelite and as a priest. And he anticipates that they will now be fulfilled. He speaks over his own baby and says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High. You will go on before the Lord and prepare the way for him to give people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of God. And then he refers to Jesus. He says, the rising sun will come down to us from heaven. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But the lesson for us here simply is to not give up hope because help is coming. Salvation is coming and has indeed now come through Jesus Christ. Thirdly, we don't need to be afraid because God is true to his word and he's faithful to all the promises he makes. In verse 20, Gabriel very clearly says, look, the words that I've spoken to you are going to happen. God has said so, basically. And God is, is faithful to the prophecies and to the words that had come many years before. Imagine the joy Zechariah has when he can finally speak again after the birth of his son and he can announce the end of 400 years of waiting to see if God would send his chosen servant. He picks up where the psalmists and the prophets left off. He said, praise be to the Lord. He has come to his people and redeemed them. He's raised up salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. And then it kind of says in brackets, as he said through his prophets long ago. You see, God's word came to pass. And whenever God speaks a prophetic word through his prophets, they are real and true and they will be fulfilled. We know that Zechariah had trouble believing that at first. And not believing God's word has consequences. For Zechariah, it meant he was silent throughout the rest of his wife's pregnancy. Imagine him not being able to give words of comfort or encouragement or to easily express his thoughts. But there are eternal consequences for those who choose to reject God's word in this life. Jesus simply said, if you acknowledge me before people, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. But if you don't acknowledge me, you're going to be rejected by God at the end of the day. But there's good news and there's hope in these verses that Zechariah uh, speaks out. It's amazing to notice the detail in verse 72. And uh, these are very poetic words. It's written in a very pro poetic way. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Zechariah speaks out a sentence that actually contains the, the meanings of the names of his family. So he, he says, the Lord is coming to show mercy to our ancestors and to remember his holy covenant. And God's mercy or his grace is wrapped up in, in John's name. John means beloved, loved by God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. And then the name Zechariah means remembered, remembered by God and, and that God remembers and fulfills his word. And then the last line of that sentence uh, refers to the covenant of God, the agreement between God and people. And Elizabeth means oath or covenant, the agreement between us. That's amazing that again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Zechariah is able to unpick the meaning of his family's names in a very poetic and inspiring way. Fear not, God is true to his word. The next reason I have for us not to be afraid is that the Messiah is going to bring salvation. 
We just read that Zechariah talks about salvation being raised up in the, in the house of David. And of course, the town of David is Bethlehem, where Jesus was born. Through the Holy Spirit and through prophecy, Zechariah says that salvation is coming. He anticipates the fulfilment of that longing as God has promised both boys, both the forerunner and then the saviour. And and Zechariah mentions that through this salvation, through the saviour, through Jesus, we can go on and serve the Lord without fear. It would have been a fearful thing to serve God in Zechariah's time. Of course, Rome had invaded and taken over uh, the whole of Israel and they were very much subject to the, to the will and the, the decisions of Caesar who was worshipped by the Romans as a god himself. It might have been very threatening to serve the Lord when there was somebody who could pull the plug at any moment on that. But the gospel writer John later on writes a letter to the church and he says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out or drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the Israelites certainly could have felt the wrath of of Roman soldiers and understandably been afraid. But when we're secure in the love of God, so much of our fear is taken away. We don't need to fear death. We don't need to fear persecution. We don't need to be afraid as we serve God because we know that our destiny is ultimately in his hands and he will always do right by us. And closely related to that, our last fear not this morning is that the pathway to peace is going to be illuminated. You know, we've no need to live in fear of darkness, of the turmoil in our world, or even death itself. There's good news for us, especially in this day and age, wrapped up in the idea that the light has come. The true light of the world was about to arrive as God in the flesh. God Almighty wrapped up in a baby-sized package. Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh, come down from heaven. The word who was God and was with God becomes flesh, the baby Jesus Christ. And again, Zechariah speaks words that inspire and encourage hope instead of fear. He quotes Malachi chapter 4 verse 2 saying, The rising sun will come to us from heaven He's talking about Jesus as the son of righteousness risen with healing in his wings. And then Zechariah tells us why and the purpose of this uh, arrival of the light of the world. Jesus is coming, he says, to shine light on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the path of peace. And those promises again are fulfilled from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 and 59 verse 8 if you want to look at those prophecies of long ago. Now, Zechariah says, they're about to be fulfilled in the second baby. You know, we don't need to be afraid when there's light. It's sometimes quite reasonable to be a little bit afraid of the dark because in the darkness we can stumble, we can miss trip hazards, we can we can't see the obstacles that we might bump into and therefore end up with injuries and pain. But when the light is on, it's great because you can see clearly, you can see obstacles and how to avoid them. You can see what's ahead. You can see that there's, there's good things coming. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel, perhaps. Jesus is the one who is the light and who brings the light to those who live in the shadow of death. And that's all of us as humanity, constantly living under the threat of natural disasters, of wars, of all the things that Jesus said would happen as the world builds towards this climax of his return. So we have good news because when there's light, we don't need to fear. We can see clearly. So as we kind of consider these these reasons why Zechariah didn't have to be afraid and why we don't have to be afraid. 
I just want to also note that Zechariah could very much have focused his attention on his own suffering, on his own pain and sadness. He could have been very easily distracted by political chaos and the Roman occupancy, but his attention was focused on God and on serving him in the temple and in the holy place, not on the problems around him. And that's why it's so important that Zechariah mentioned the Saviour enables us to serve him without fear. Zechariah, of course, was waiting for the birth of his own boy, John, but his focus was also on the imminent arrival of Mary's boy. His attention was on alerting Israel to Christ's advent, his first coming here into this world. And the lesson that we can learn is quite simply articulated in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. You know, this time of Advent, this season leading up to Christmas, is a busy time and we turn all our attention to making preparations and plans. We can give attention to things like the tree, the presents, the crackers, the tinsel, the very special M&S turkey that's going to absolutely revolutionise our lives. Or the adventures of Kevin the Carrot, if you're an Aldi fan. But we can, in the midst of all the hustle and bustle and all the preparations, move our attention off the main event. And I just want to uh, encourage you all this morning, during this season, to do what Zechariah did, to go into the holy place and bring your worship and your prayers and your devotion to God, to fix your focus on Jesus at this time. And like Zechariah, we can learn to hope in the Lord because his promises will come to pass. We perhaps sometimes say, wait on the Lord. I love Psalm 27, which ends with, wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And the Hebrew word kavar, which we often translate as wait, actually means to entwine or to be twisted together with God like strands of a rope or being wrapped tightly up in God and with God and in his purposes. And Isaiah chapter 40 encourages us to wait on the Lord, to entwine with God, to be twisted tightly together with him. It's in that waiting, that active waiting on God that our strength is renewed or exchanged, like, like swapping one set of clothing for another. The weariness of waiting for prayers to be answered lifts when we wait on the Lord and we can soar on eagles' wings instead of frantically flapping like the turkey who knows Christmas dinner is just around the corner. So we can learn in our waiting that God fulfills his word. And now we're anticipating the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ into the world, this time not as a little baby, meek and mild, but as our glorious redeemer, our saviour, the one who's going to bring justice and put everything right in the end. And we can learn that waiting for God doesn't have to be a passive thing, but it's a time when we can pray, seek God's face and entwine our hearts with his plans and purposes. We can twist our lives together to be in him and with him and be wrapped up in Jesus Christ as we wrap our own presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you so loved the world. You sent Jesus to be our Redeemer, our Saviour, our Lord, the worker of justice, our Deliverer. Thank you that light has come into the world. Thank you for illuminating to us the pathway of peace as we follow in your footsteps. Amen. We've spoken this morning about how Jesus is the light that's come down to shine on the darkness and that he is the one who, who was sent from heaven and will rise with healing in his wings. But Jesus himself also said, I am the true bread that comes down from heaven. And as we take communion this morning, we're going to just meditate on that fact that that God himself came and dwelt amongst us, that he 
gives us stuff to feed on, to nourish our spiritual lives and to fill our hearts with hope and joy. I don't know about you, but I'm very grateful that being secure in God's love means that actually we have nothing to fear because he is with us and God wraps himself in symbols that we can understand so simply. Jesus is wrapped up in these emblems, in the bread and in the cup that we take. So if you'd like to break bread with me, please do so. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we feed on him, the bread of heaven. Jesus said he was the bread that had come down from heaven. He was the light of the world. He also said, I am the vine. And you, if you abide in me, you'll be like the branches. So we take the fruit of the vine, the grape, and we have wine or juice that symbolizes his body and his blood. And once again, Jesus is wrapped up in these amazing and wonderful emblems. After the supper, Jesus took the cup and gave thanks. And he said, this blood is the new covenant. This this cup is the new covenant poured out in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So we thankfully remember that Jesus' blood was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's a timely reminder at Christmas time to abide in the one who is the true vine. Let's take the cup. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can feed on your word and we can feed on you the bread of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for being our saviour and redeemer, for being Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for making yourself present to us in these symbols in a mysterious way, Lord. But we know that as we feed on the bread and the fruit of the vine, we are somehow taking something of you into ourselves and help us to do that throughout this Advent season to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Love incarnate, love divine Star and angels bear the sign Bow to babe on bended knee The saviour of humanity Unto us a child is born He shall reign forevermore No
born to raise us from the grave. Christ the everlasting Lord, He shall reign We've come now to the end of our service. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Thank you to Simon and thank you to Emma. I'm going to close the service now with these words. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you all.